and welcome to Sunday Online here at London Riverside Church. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us for church today. If it's your first time with us, then why not use the QR code below to fill out the form and someone will be in touch with you just so we can get to know each other. You know, something we love to do here at London Riverside Church every week is worship with one another. So I invite you now to worship with us as we glorify the King of Kings. What an incredible time of worship that was. And you know, we're going to continue our time of worship now as we take our tithes 
and offerings. If you call LRC your spiritual home and you'd like to consider partnering with us in everything that we do to reach the people of Dagenham and beyond, then the QR code is going to come up below. You can scan that for all the ways in which you can give. And we want to thank you so much and extend a, a warm thanks to all of you who do help us achieve what we do and, and reach the people that we do reach. And, and we're going to continue with our service now as we continue on to the preach. It's going to be an amazing word. So let's sit back. Let's get ready to learn, ready to hear from God and all he has to say to us. My name is Paige. My name is Miss Dina. And this is Church Life. Coming up on the 28th of February is the child dedication. We're going to be holding the class on the 28th of January. So if you would like your child to sign up to the dedication, make sure you head over to our website or go to the info point after the service. This week is Connect Group Week. Make sure you join a Connect Group if you are not part of one at our information point at the end of the service or online. Today we want to highlight the car park team. Um, if you don't serve in the church already but you would like to serve, make sure you head over to our website to sign up or you can go to the info point to get some more information about all the different teams that you can join and help out with at the church. We hope you had a lovely new year. That's been all from us at Church Live today. I'm Miss Dina. I'm Paige. Bye. Uh, okay, now before uh, Reg comes to share God's word with us today, which we're really looking forward to, I just want to highlight something that we launched last year, and that is the leadership development path. And so we've already run through a year. We're starting again in February, the first Saturday in February. And I want us just to be all aware of it. So there's some details up there behind me. You can find out more on the website, of course, or scan the QR code. Just to highlight, though, Leadership Development Path, it's not only for those maybe involved in church ministry, but it's for those that are leading in the workplace. In fact, most of the people that did a Leadership Development Path last year were actually applying what they were learning into their workplace situations and the places of responsibility that they have. So that's why we're really excited about this. It really crosses over between what church ministry and also the workplace. And uh, you, that we do five Saturdays, five Saturday mornings, in the year, okay? But they're, in, they're very uh, rich in content. We have resources that you can use between times. There is also a weekly email to help you on your leadership journey. So I want to encourage you to sign up for that if that's for you this year, okay? While there's spaces, we, we do want to start on the first Saturday of February, but it's an excellent opportunity, friends. God has gifted us. There's so much potential in this room online Wherever we are, as a church family, God's just you're really going to favor us. I'm not going to start preaching. I'm just going to talk about the leadership development path. But I want to encourage you, sign up for it if it's for you this year. Uh, we're going to have an excellent time. Come talk to me afterwards. I can let you know more information about that. Now let's welcome Ray. Just encourage him as he comes to share God's word. Go for it, Reg. Morning, everyone. Hope you are doing well, whether you are downstairs Upstairs, in the overflow, really good to be with you this morning. If you want to open up your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, we will uh, start there together. And then we're going to go into 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, so 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 37 to 40 is what we are particularly looking at. And we are looking at the life of Elijah and how sometimes they, there are mountain highs that we go on. And there are sometimes the valley lows that we face. And what do we do in those situations? So let's read 1 Kings chapter 18, 37 to 40 together. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and they licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, when the, all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. 
1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 3. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more so, also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, where, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. What we see in this moment, really, is that Elijah has gone from a mountain high where he's defeated the enemy, where he's taken them down, where he's declared that God is actually true and is real, and that their gods, their false gods, are not, not real, they're not there, they're not about, they're not a thing. And then he hears the words that Jezebel says, and he runs away, he runs away from the situation. Uh, I find it interesting that there are mountain highs where we feel God's presence around us. We feel God's power around us in our situation, so we feel like we've got victory. And then there are valley lows where we do not feel like God's presence is there. We do not feel like his power is there, and we feel defeated in our situation. And both are interesting because mountain highs, they're really exciting moments, they're joyful moments, exhilarating moments where God has performed miracles. The valley lows are, are, are terrible. They feel like the trials, the tri tribulations and tests are consistently coming our way. But the truth of the matter for all of us is that regardless of all of that, God is still good. The mountain highs are an opportunity for us to look at what God has done in our lives. The, mountain, the valley lows are an opportunity for us to see God in the situation and how he can pull through for us. Both are good for our spiritual growth and development. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it challenges us, inspires us, and equips us to be all that we're supposed to be. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the questions I'm always asking myself or asking in life is why? Why? Uh, the question always comes up to me uh, in my mind. Why did I have to have knee surgery on my knee? Uh, Martin obviously knows it wasn't seven hours or two and a half hours, but it was five hours. He's in the overflow right now, so... Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm saying that, but he's in the overflow knowing that it was five hours. Uh, why, 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 why uh, do I constantly want to, why do I have this thought about what am I going to be remembered by um, with my kids when I eventually pass away and then by my grandkids? Why is that thought consistently on my mind? Why do I see people when I'm driving picking their nose? <laughs> like, it's see-through. I can see you digging, looking for gold. Why, why do superheroes wear their pants on the outside of their uniform? Like, why? Why is that a thing? Why is constantly going through my mind to the point where it, you can see on my face when I'm questioning things? Like, oh, why, is, why have you done that? And my face contorts. It looks all different. You can see on my face what I am thinking, the question of why, why, why. To the point, my family and I, have we've made a little song about why, why, why. I'm not going to sing it for you because it's just my immediate family. We're, we're family. I know we're family, but I'm talking about like, the immediate family. And uh, why is constantly on my face, and I have to sometimes be careful. Uh, on Friday, at the, week of, at the end of the week of prayer, someone said to Sherry and I, oh, Reg, during your preach, you didn't mention food once. Why? <laughs> so all my illustrations today will be about food. I was at a barbecue years ago, and a friend of ours was at the barbecue um, grilling and doing what he was doing, and I felt sorry for him because it was a cold barbecue. He should have got a gas one, and he was crying because of all the soot that was in his face. He was upset by what was going on, and I'm sitting there watching it just like, why? And so... Eventually, the burgers came out, and if you know me, I take food quite seriously, especially burgers. I have a thing called Reg Burgers, and so I, I take this burger, I take a bite of the burger, and why does it taste like this? And so I didn't know people were watching me, but I went into the, the house, and I looked inside the bin to find the packaging, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, why does it say 2% beef? 93% rat and a million percent sawdust. This, why? 
Like, why? Why is... I realize my faith says why a lot. And so when I come to read this passage, I think to myself, well, why has Elijah run away from a situation? He's just seen God do something miraculous. He's just seen God move powerfully. Why is he running away? And I wonder if it's something to do with the situation that he finds himself and the people around him. King Ahab was the king at the time, and in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 to 33, it says, Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as a wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he, went, then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, a lot of Baals here, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab would, uh, made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who had gone before him. And I asked myself the question, well, why was Ahab like this? Why did he behave like this? What was, why was he doing what he was doing? To go back a little bit in history to understand what it was like for him. Now, uh, 1 Samuel read how the people of God wanted to be like the other nations in the world. And they said, uh, we want a king to rule over us. We want someone to rule over us. That's what we want. We want a king. God's like, I don't know, but sure, go for it. So they picked Saul to be their king, basically on the premise that he looked better than everyone else. That was, that was really why he got the job. And so at that point, you have the United Kingdom of Israel, and everyone's united, everyone seems to be happy. Then Saul dies, it gets passed on to his son. He doesn't rule for too long, gets passed on to David. David rules, gets passed on to his son Solomon, then gets passed on to Rehoboam. Uh, and then at that point, there's an issue where someone tries to usurp Rehoboam, and there's an issue that takes place. So the kingdom splits. You then have Israel and Judah. And what happens is that Rehoboam takes over Judah, and Jeroboam takes over Israel. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, 28, we get this description that Jeroboam turns people's hearts away from God. And so he starts this process of doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he passes on to his son and he does evil. Then the Bible says that he gets killed, he gets passed on to somebody else. He does evil, gets passed on to his son. He does evil, he gets killed. He, that person gets killed, he does evil. We then get to... This particular part where we see uh, Zimri in verse 19, because of the sins that he committed in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in the sins which he committed to make Israel sin. And I, I find it fascinating that Jeroboam's name keeps getting brought up. That he, he keeps getting mentioned that his sin is the reason why someone else is sinning. Which denotes to us that there are things in our own lives that we have to cut off at the source, otherwise it may get passed down in generations. There are certain actions that we do that will get passed on from one generation to another. There are certain phrases that we say that if we're not careful, will get passed on from one generation to another. There are certain things that we do that if we're not careful, will get passed on from one generation to another. And so this happens in Ahab encompasses all of the evil and says, well, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it better. He, he, he sinned more than anybody else that was before him. He took it to the next level. We get this reputation of Ahab. His decision-making was terrible, absolutely terrible. He was consistently doing things that would annoy God, consistently doing things that would cause people to turn their gaze away from Jesus, away from God, Onto a false God. And I ask this question, well, why? 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 And it's because the president hadn't been set that we follow God in all our ways. Let me encourage you, from one generation to another, let's continuously proclaim the name of Jesus so that the next generation speak of it well. In fact, make sure your young people go to youth on a Friday night, which starts this Friday coming, so that they can proclaim that God is good. Get involved in connect groups so that you too can proclaim that God is good. We can do this together. So this is what Elijah was up against, entrenched in the king's attitude that we can sin against God and lead people away. 
And so he comes to his mountain high experience. He comes to his mountain high experience. Psalm 105 verse 5 says, sorry, Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Elijah recognized this. He understood this because he saw it in his own life. He understood that if God is good all the time and all the time that God is well done. 1 Kings chapter 17, we get this introduction where God tells Elijah, tell the people that there's going to be a drought. God then leads Elijah to a brook and says, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to look after you. You just stay there. I'm going to send some ravens to bring you meat and bread. I love this, food. God was providing. God was providing daily in the morning and in the evening. God was providing. God then says to Elijah, okay, go away from this place. And the widow is going to look after you. She's going to look after you. And he says, okay, can I have some water to the widow? She says, sure. As she's walking away, Elijah calls out saying, can I have some bread as well? Food. I I love this because Elijah was being cheeky with his request. But the lady said to him, I I don't know if I've even got enough for me. I don't know if I've got enough for my family, and you're asking for, for this? Okay, we'll see what happens. And Elijah says, don't worry, it's going to be okay. God's going to provide. God's going to look after us. And then later on in the account, her son dies, and Elijah prays to God and says, God, will you bring this boy, this guy back to life? Bring him back to life. Let him live. And lo and behold, that happens. See, Elijah is experiencing God's goodness. He's experiencing God's favor. And we get to 1 Kings chapter 18, and God tells Elijah, hey, listen, it's you. now you need to go to Ahab. You need to tell him that the drought's going to end. And this, there's this, like, faith that rises up in Elijah. says, yeah, sure, let's do it. I'll go. And I think the reason why he was comfortable in going, the reason why he was secure in going is because he had already seen God do something amazing in his life. He had already seen God provide for him. He had already seen God heal. He had already seen God bring people back from the dead, uh, provide for his needs. And if it's true for Elijah that God will provide for his needs, God will provide for your needs as well. So on the journey to the mountaintop, Elijah's experiencing these things. He's experiencing these things where God has turned up for him. And basically, there are testimonies. There are are good things, good reports that Elijah would give. And this is why we, in the middle of our service, or the beginning of our service, we we read out praise reports. The reason so it can build up faith within every single one of us. That if God can heal, if God can heal people, if God can provide a miracle for people where the doctor's reports are negative, then God can do it for you as well. That if God can provide for somebody else, he can financially bless somebody. Maybe he could bless me too in my time of lack and need. If God can open up the doors of blessing, then maybe he could open up the doors of blessing for me as well. So let me encourage you. When it comes to praise reports, fill them out and let's be encouraged by what God is doing. It makes me think, well, what would I say? What would, what would be one of the testimonies that I would, would speak about? What would the story I tell? What would I say? And I, uh, one of them would be, I went to Australia years ago and uh, I, I get into Australia was a miracle in itself. But got to Australia, and I was just checking out some churches, just seeing how they, they do what they do and trying to understand and learn and grow. And they said to me, hey, do you want to come with us on a mission trip? And I thought, sure, why not? Let's see what it's like in Australia. So they said, we're not going to tell you where we're going. We're just going to get in a room, and you're going to pray, and then we'll see what happens. I thought, that's a very interesting way of doing it. I'm used to let's plan where we're going at least so we know where we could sleep, where we might want to eat, where I might need to go to. I need to know these things in advance. But we got into the room, and we started praying, and we started asking God for, for uh, words or visions or, or anything that might indicate where we might go. And so I start seeing images of fire. Someone starts talking about a bridge, and some other people start talking about um, some, a whole bunch of different things. And after about an hour, the, the guys say, okay, we're going to tell you where we're going. And there was a fire there recently. There's a bridge that you have to cross, and this, that, and the other. And I thought, oh, that's a, okay, God, you're, you're good. This is, this is good to know that you're in this. We then get to... Um, the destination, and uh, let me just tell you, we, we went camping. I'm not a camper. It's not for me. I've done it twice in my life. That was one of them. I, I don't like it. It's cold at nighttime. I didn't, I didn't know this. 
But apparently, you have to like bring some stuff to put on the floor so that you're not cold. It's I, listen. If you like camping, God bless you. His favors upon you. But golly, that is not for me. So we start camping, and I have to ask the people to help me because I can't put up a tent. I can't do any of this stuff. This is this is. I'm from London, man. We have high rises. We don't do camping. So. Um, the next day, we then said, okay, we're going to go and start talking to people, start seeing what God's going to do. And it was raining. It was raining and raining and raining. Like, it was terrible. Like, you couldn't step outside. It was like, it was terrible rain. And so a friend of mine said, oh, you know, I, I read in the Bible that this guy prayed and the sun stood still. So I'm going to pray for it to stop raining. And I looked at him, again, the face. Yeah, sure. In my head, I was thinking, you haven't checked the BBC forecast, have you? Like, it's, it's not going to stop for another, like, two weeks here. Like, okay, sure. He started praying, and I kind of felt convicted that I should say amen to what he's saying. So I, I said amen. And then as soon as he finished, stop raining. I was like, oh, okay, God, this is good. So we went out, and we started talking to people, and started praying for people, and healing took place, and it was amazing. And I started getting hungry. And I started thinking to myself, oh, God, it would be really good if we had something nice to eat. Because the food was kind of like the burger with the rats, me, and the, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And so I was like, God, it would be nice if we could have something to eat. I don't know, like, maybe you drop a burger from the sky. I don't know, but it would be nice. And then someone said, I've been watching your group, and I just want to say, do you want to come over for dinner at my ranch? I was like, oh. Keep talking. He so, said, yeah, yeah, we, my wife and I, we've got this, like, amazing place. You can come, you can have dinner. And there was, like, ten of us at, at the time. And I thought, I'm really hoping that they're not serial killers because I, I, I could get killed and I'm not, it's a terrible place. Anyway, we went. The food was amazing. It was good. My prayer worked. <laughs> See, there's times that we can talk about God's faithfulness and his provision. That if God can look after me in a place that I didn't know where I was, in a place that was so very remote to where I needed to be, God can look after me in my home place and God can look after you as well. Time and time and time again, friends, God shows up. And so this is on the way to the mountaintop for Elijah. We, found out in, we find out in verse 4 that Ahab's wife Jezebel had massacred the prophets of Israel. He had, she had massacred, killed off people. But Obadiah, one of the servants there, he had saved a hundred prophets. He had put them in different caves and they were perfectly fine. Uh, and there's a conversation between Obadiah about if he sh- about, with uh, Obadiah and Elijah about should he go, should he not go. Obadiah's like, no, no, it's, it's dangerous times, you shouldn't go. Elijah's like, no, it's okay. God's got this. And I find it interesting at this point that he didn't listen to the words of discouragement in his life at that point. He didn't let that discourage him. But we pick up in verse 17 of chapter 18, and it says, Then it happened that Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the bowels. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel and 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. I love it that Elijah's bold because he's seen what God has done in, in him. There's a boldness to him that his situation cannot win because of the God that he serves. Verse 20, so Ahab went, sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it, lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you call in the name of your gods and I will call in the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, so for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped, unpo- oh, sorry, they leaped about the altar which they made. 
And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked him, saying, Cry loud, he is a god. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on the journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. I love this because Elijah's saying, Maybe he's on the toilet seat. Like maybe your god's not paying attention. He's busy with what he's doing. Then they cried aloud and cut themselves, and as it was their custom with knives and lances, and so the blood gushed out on them. And then midday was past. They prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And they, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord, sorry, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. With, then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two sieves of seed. He then put the, the wood on, in order, cut the ball in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. They did it a third time. Just a thought for you. Where did the water come from? It's been a drought. Where would they have gathered the water from? Uh, I'm surmising that this is precious water that they collected to uh, obviously live. And then Elijah saying, pour the water, not once, not twice, but three times. And I had this thought that if the God could um, give something that was precious, then maybe... there we go then maybe we ourselves could give our own lives for what God wants to do this idea that something precious is given something precious is used and a miracle takes place maybe God wants to make a miracle in your life and eventually the story goes on that God answers them and the fire comes down and the, 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 the sacrifice is burned. Everything is taken away. Everything is gone, proving that God is real. Elijah tells everyone to seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone escape. And so that happens. And I can imagine at this particular point that Elijah must have felt like he was the man. Elijah must have felt like he was the one who was doing something amazing, that he was doing something fantastic, that with God, everything is impossible. If you notice earlier, Elijah says, I'm the only one who's around. Not quite true. There are a hundred other prophets around, so he's not alone. And this idea that mountain highs, we, we feel God's presence, we feel his power, we feel him in our situation, which means that we have the victory, gives us an opportunity to speak the goodness of God and remember and give him thanks, knowing that there's more to come. There's more to come. Mountaintop moments are there for us to give us revelation so that when we come down from the mountaintops, we can remember what God has done for us and walk confidently in his grace. I don't know if you remember in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus' Jesus' transfiguration takes place. Peter says, let's camp here. I think camping might be biblical. Peter says, let's camp here. Let's stay here and enjoy what this situation. Jesus is like, no, we, at some point we're going to have to go down. At some point we're going to have to live life And I think the way to combat this idea of wanting to stay in a mountaintop is to consistently give God thanks and tell people about it. Let them experience his goodness, his grace, his mercy. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. This idea that we let other people know about who he is, we give him praise. So we have mountain highs and valley lows. Mountain highs and valley lows. Valley lows, what does that look like? 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 3. Uh, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and also how he had executed all the prophets with one sword, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, basically, I'm going to do worse to you than anybody else. That's what I'm going to do. And upon hearing that word, upon hearing that message, Elijah runs away from the situation. He runs away from the situation. And I find it very fascinating that he didn't run towards God. He didn't run towards community because, remember, there's there's still a hundred other prophets around that he could have spoken to. He ran away completely. 
And Elijah allowed the screaming of the enemy. He allowed the screaming of the enemy to, to shout louder than that of the sovereignty of his God. Elijah allowed the, the restrictive words of the enemy bind him instead of being re- listening, to the, the lis- listening to the releasing word of God. Elijah allowed the fraudulent words of the enemy to spread fear in his life instead of resting in the faithful words of God. Valley lows, we don't feel God's presence. We don't feel like his power is there in our situation, so we feel defeated. But friends, let me tell you, it's a lie. It's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the enemy to keep your mouth silent from giving him thanks. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Friends, you might feel down and out, but let me tell you, God has not quit on you. You might feel like there's no way out, but let me tell you, God has not forgotten you. You might feel like help isn't coming, but let me tell you that God has not given up on you. He hasn't quit on you. God is still there with you. He's in your situation. He's in your circumstance. Our God is there for you. Which then makes me wonder, if we reframe our thinking to what is he trying to teach me in this situation, we get these thoughts, that valley low points can be profited from. Valley low points can be profited from. It's an opportunity to ask God for wisdom. Valley low points can change our perspective. Gaining the things of this world is not good for our souls if it means losing our faith. Valley low points can deepen our love for God. It gives us an opportunity to understand that God is sovereign in in every situation. And I think this led to Elijah doing a couple of things. One, rest. I think he needed rest both physically, mentally, spiritually. Verses 4 to 8 of chapter 19 talks about how he spoke to God and he was honest with God. And he said to God, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm tired of living. Just take me away. But it's fascinating that God just let him rest. Gave him food and let him rest. Under a tree, he let him rest. Second thing that he did was that he re- there was a reset. For Elijah, he needed to remember who God was. He needed to remember that he was led by his spirit. He needed to remember who God is in his situation, allowing the mountaintop highs, the mountaintop moments that we go through to encourage him in what he is facing. There needed to be a reset. I said it earlier, that, but Elijah wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. There were 100 prophets that he could have spoken to, 100 prophets he could have been in community with, he could have connected with. So make sure you're connected via connect groups. We're starting next week, next week, this week, in fact. So get plugged in, get involved, reset, be in community. Third thing that he did was that he had a refocus. The fire was relit under his belly. Chapter 19, verse 15 to 16, God is telling him, anoint a couple of people. One of them is going to be your successor. So for Elijah, he had the, the, his, the fire relit to then disciple someone in all the things of God. And then all of that, through that, Elijah was restored. Through the rest, through the reset, through the refocus, Elijah was restored. And I think the same thing for us can be applicable. That if you're feeling like you're in the valley low, you're feeling like... There's, it's, it's dark, it's horrible. Understand that you listen to God. Remember who God is. Praise him. You can be restored. Peter, who, was, who wanted to be on the mountaintops, he wanted to camp on the mountaintop. He, 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 he sees Jesus gets arrested in John chapter 18 and, and he runs away, panics and says, no, I don't know who he is. He rejects Jesus. And in that moment, he's in the valley low. He's down. He's down and out. He doesn't feel like he has a way back. He doesn't feel like he can come back. But in John chapter 21, Jesus restores him back to where he should be. Jesus restores him back to where he should be. And the same thing can be said for us, that Jesus can restore you back to where you should be. It's not over, friends. The valley is not the sum total of our experience with God. Aren't we stand? See, mountain highs, we feel God's presence and power moving in our situation. So we feel victorious. We give him thanks, remembering that, this, that, that, that there's more to come. Valley lows, we don't feel God's presence is around us. We don't feel his power is there. We feel defeated. But let me tell you, it's a lie from the enemy to keep you from giving God praise. We were, Sharon and I were doing a pre-marital course with a couple 
came over when Liverpool were playing Barcelona in the Champions League final. And I'll be honest with you, I really thought about rescheduling then. But I thought, no, okay, let's do the right thing. We've already said it, let's do it. So we, we had the meeting. And as soon as the meeting finished, okay, not as soon as, it makes me sound bad. A little while later, I turn the TV on. The boss is looking at me, so I need to behave myself. Uh, a little while later, uh, I turn the TV on. And I realised we three. We lost the first leg 3-0. Oh, uh, oh, man, that sucks. That is not good. Okay, I thought, okay, we're a good team, so when we come back to Anfield, I thought we'd win maybe 2-0, and it, overall, it, it looks like a nice defeat, right? It's not that bad. It's not that bad. But I was away again, so I didn't get to watch that match either. But my phone kept popping up, 1-0, 2-0, 3-0, 4-0. We beat Barcelona, the best player in the world. Some of our players injured and not allowed to play. And it made me realise that this truth, Sometimes we have a very limited understanding of what victory looks like. Like we, we, we'll, we'll make do with, we'll make do with, with a little bit of, of hope. We'll make do with a little bit of healing. We'll make do with a little bit of provision. But God's like, no, I want to give you it completely. I want to give you a four-nil victory, so you can go on and win the Champions League. That's the God that we serve and maybe for the next one minute we can give God praise we can give him adoration for how great he is how wonderful he is that he's looked after us that he's provided for us that he's healed us that he's done what he said he's going to do maybe for the next 30 seconds we can lift up our hands and point to the one who has made a difference maybe we could lift up our voice and talk with our own, own voices our own sound about how good God is how he's been there for us in every situation he hasn't let us down that Christ is our firm foundation. He's the rock on which we stand. That is the God that we serve. He is so, so good. Maybe as a church, we can lift up the name that is above every other name. That the name, the sound of his name, every knee shall bow. Every tongue must confess that he is Lord. That's the God that we serve. He's all powerful. He's all conquering. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. God, we give you all praise. We worship you for who you are, my King. We worship you for who you are, my King. Jesus, we praise your name. Maybe you're in the valley lows this morning. Maybe you're in the valley lows and you're, you're not feeling like things are going quite right. You don't know which way to turn, which way to look. You, everything feels dark and it feels dim. But let me, let me tell you this. Let me encourage you with this. God has not given up on you. God has not given up on you. And if you're saying to me, Rage, this morning, I, I'm in the valley lows and I, I would love to feel the presence of God in my situation. Just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. You're in the valley lows right now and you're asking for God to intervene in your situation. Let's see your hand. Whether you're on the overflow as well, raise up your hand as well. Raise up your hand. You're in the valley lows and you want to cry out to Jesus. This is the moment. Father, I thank you and I worship you. I thank you. God, I thank you for every hand that is lifted up today. I thank you that you see them as an individual, not as a simply as a collective body of people, but as an individual, which means you know their individual needs, you know their individual cares, you know their individual wants, you know the valley that they're walking through. Father, I thank you that you know them by name. God, I thank you. I thank you that you're such a personal God. Father, for every hand that is raised, whether it is healing of the mind, healing of the body, healing of the soul, Jesus, I pray that you give it to them in the mighty name of Jesus. God, for those of us who need a door open for us in our workplace, God, open up that door. God, for those of us who are praying, believing, for family members who are sick spiritually, I pray for family members to come back to Jesus. God, I pray for that to happen. Jesus mighty name let the love the love of Jesus saturate their lives God for those of us who feel beat up by the world God I pray your peace to be upon them I thank you that you're there in the mountain highs you're there in the valley lows my God you are consistently good Jesus my prayer
what an incredible and inspirational word that was. If you were listening today and something was touching your heart, maybe you want to accept Jesus into your life for the first time or the next time. If that is you, I would love to say a prayer with you. Why don't you close your eyes, bow your head and say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you died for us. We recognise all we have done. We recognise that we've messed up and we also recognise our need for a saviour. And we recognise that you fulfil that. We recognise that you died for us, Lord. So we pray right now that we're able to enter a relationship with you. And we pray that each day you help us to strengthen that relationship with you as we continue this journey. In your mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. If you said that, we are so excited for you. It's the best decision you could possibly ever make. And if you did say that, then there's a QR code and a form that you can fill out just so we can help you in the next steps of your journey. And and we really just want to journey that with you as you've made the best decision you possibly can. And that's that's it for Sunday Online today. If you would like any more information on what we're up to, then you can visit our social medias at London Riverside Church, or you can check out our website for what's coming up as well. In the meantime, have a good week and we'll see you next Sunday.